Peter Schnell was a loser. Every soldier in the brigade knew that, especially himself. It wasn't that he was a bad guy. It was just that he wasn't really good at anything. He passed the Army physical fitness test, but no matter how hard he tried, he always did everything with difficulty, hobbled, red-faced and puffing like a steam engine, barely keeping time. Usually after a run, he had to step aside, vomiting. Sometimes he didn't go far, so most guys knew to give him some time. He couldn't seem to get into really good shape no matter how hard he tried. He always reminded me of a sack of potatoes. Qualifying shoots meant he would be the last one to leave the range, again barely meeting the standard. He had a bad haircut, a crumpled uniform, perpetually untied bootlaces, a skewed crumpled hat. That's the kind of soldier he was. It was so deep in him that it made one secretly wonder if he was a soldier who crumpled himself instead of his uniform. Through persistence and a lot of luck, he was promoted to sergeant. It just took a lot more sergeants that year than usual. It happens sometimes, especially in wartime. And no one really disliked him, but no one really considered him their best friend. He didn't hang out with the other guys, didn't play video games or watch many movies because he had a tendency to get nasty headaches. He wasn't a leader. No one would follow him to hell. Maybe to the cafeteria, at least on pizza day, but not to hell. The only notable thing he ever did was climb into a burning Humvee to pull another soldier out after blowing it up with an IED. A couple minutes later, the badly burned soldier, Private Tony Campbell, died in his arms before an evacuation medical helicopter even approached. The guy was also just about to go on guard duty. It devastated him and pretty much destroyed Schnell's entire self-esteem. Schnell ended up getting a medal for what he did, but it was more like the commanding officer saying, you really tried hard. At the award ceremony, when they were describing his attempt to comfort a dying soldier, I remember him looking very green the whole time. It was obvious that he felt he had failed again. His marriage, if you could call it that, was an absolute disaster. He got married more or less because his overbearing mother wanted him to. She introduced him to a girl named Janice, whom she liked very much, perhaps even more than she had ever liked himself. It was as if his opinion had been forced upon him. The marriage lasted less than three years and ended worse than usual when we were on a business trip. We didn't stay out very long before the rumors started flying. Janice had been seen at a club. Janice was seen with a guy in a restaurant. Janice was seen with a guy in a hotel. Janice actually put some guy in their house. Four different guys. A couple civilians and a couple military. Pretty bold to put some guy in their house on base. And the brigade sergeant major, when he heard about it, put a stop to it. There were rumors that he also ruined a couple of quarries because of it, but I never knew that for sure. He couldn't really affect her civilian guys, but no soldier could ever be beyond the reach of a really pissed off sergeant major. I think someone must have also told Schnell everything. Janice found out what he knew and emptied the house and their bank account of all his combat pay and savings. By the day he arrived, she was long gone, so he returned to an empty house. That may have been the worst part of the whole thing. He never managed to demand an explanation from her. He never managed to face her, tell her who she was, and get her to accept this shit, at least for a moment. And maybe get some of her self-respect back. Or in Schnell's case, maybe grow some self-respect. He couldn't even turn to his family since his mother apparently believed all the stories Janice had told her and had largely disowned him. Or maybe Janice had told her the truth, since neither of them seemed to have thought much of him from the start. All he could do was move on and sign the divorce papers that had been left on the kitchen table. There was simply no point in contesting anything. Six weeks later, the divorce, drawn up on his knees, was finalized. He had to pay Janice some sort of maintenance for six months. She claimed to be broke and even said she had sold his car. Rumor had it that one of her boyfriends was driving around in his old car, so she probably just gave it to the boyfriend. In a time-honored military tradition, a couple of guys raised some money and took him to a really high-end strip club in Atlanta. It was probably more out of a sense of obligation than because they honestly liked him. Instead of getting tons of private dances and getting drunk like he was supposed to do, I heard he kept whining to one of the girls there about how his life had turned to shit. I was pretty sure he was paying his own way while she listened to him. Sergeant Schnell was simply not a winner. 
He never had been, and now he wouldn't have that opportunity. He's lying in a coffin. I attended his funeral for no real definite reason. He wasn't one of my soldiers, wasn't in my company, let alone the platoon I was responsible for. I didn't know him that well. I didn't even know he was still in the squad. I vaguely remembered that he had been assigned to brigade headquarters sometime after our return, but that was about it. In fact, I hadn't seen him for months. By the time of the funeral, there weren't even that many of us left in the unit who had been deployed here with him. That's a soldier's life, moving to a different unit every few years. Maybe because of this, he let command know that he didn't want his funeral to be mandatory and didn't want a full military funeral. Why drag people to the funeral of someone they didn't even know? He wanted it to be quiet. For some reason, this bothered me. I even heard that he was supposed to be cremated right after the funeral. Soldiers are soldiers, even Peter Schnell, and the thought that there wouldn't be a full funeral made me a little nervous. My wife was back home helping her mother with some home repairs, so I had too much free time on my hands. Schnell just kept resurfacing on the surface of my brain. The thought tormented me until I got up that Saturday morning, put on my dress suit, and headed to church on the hill. When I arrived, the church was almost empty. There were only the brigadier sergeant major standing by the casket and the colonel looking out over the nearly empty parking lot. The chaplain must have stepped out for a moment. I walked over to pay my respects and looked down at Schnell. He was wrinkled, as if folded inside himself, and instead of his usual bad haircut, his head was nakedly shaved. He was waxy pale. Cancer. I turned at the voice. Sergeant Major? Brain cancer, Sergeant. Those headaches he always had turned out to be inoperable brain cancer. He said it in a wooden voice, staring at the body. I closed my eyes for a second. Of all the shit we'd been through, he dies of cancer? Not the quickest death. Something, almost a smile, touched the corner of the petty officer's mouth. It did, Sergeant. That's really what it was like. I blinked. He seemed almost pleased. But a sergeant major is never satisfied. Not in my experience anyway, and certainly damn sure not at a soldier's funeral. He looked me over from head to toe. Your uniform looks good. I'm going to need some help folding the flag. I nodded. At least I could do something. It wasn't exactly a request anyway. We talked, and I stood at the back of the church so I could step forward at the right time to help with the flag. At first, I thought it would just be me, the brigade commander, and the sergeant major, but little by little, the soldiers started to arrive, some in dress uniforms, some in casual uniforms, and some in civilian clothes. Actually, a lot more than I expected. I suppose it ate up more than just me, but they were still only a small number for a huge church. I was watching the clock move slowly when I heard a murmur running through the crowd. Schnell's ex-wife walked inside, along with an older woman who must have been his mother. Janice boldly made her way straight to the front of the church and, without even glancing at the casket or attempting to pay her respects, headed straight for the empty pew for the next of kin at the front. Just as they were about to sit down, a sergeant major came up and blocked their path. He gently but firmly guided them one pew back. I could see Schnell's ex-wife hissing at him, trying to argue, but it was rather pointless. The man wouldn't have achieved his position by deferring to anyone. Looking more than a little annoyed, they backed off. After about three minutes, the world came to a complete standstill, losing all meaning. A long black limousine pulled up almost silently to the main steps of the church. They got out, went straight up the stairs to the main doors of the church, then straight down the center aisle of the church, perfectly in step, perfectly in sync. It was unreal, more like a scene from a movie than anything from real life. As they passed, I felt something click in my brain, like a flash of radio interference on the network. A perfect set of the most attractive women I'd ever seen. Not just the pretty girls in the neighborhood, or even the ones so pretty that she should be in a movie. They looked eerily flawless and untouchable. Perfect, polished, and graceful. An oddly matched set, even though they were completely different. A redhead with bright green eyes partially hidden by a black veil halfway down her face. An icy platinum blonde with pale blue eyes and pale white skin. A tiny, dashing veil barely covering her forehead. An Asian girl, 
probably Korean from the looks of her, with a similarly beveled short veil, and a dark-skinned girl with light brown eyes above high cheekbones, who had a similarly beveled short veil. They were wearing the same dress, tight-fitting, of black silk, insanely short, with a neckline in the back as low as legally possible, black silk gloves, and 15-inch stiletto heels that no woman I'd ever met would even try to walk in. Yet they walked straight down the aisle in perfect syncopation. They moved with absolute grace and elegance. I admit I was distracted for a moment. The silly thought, you don't see that every day, ran through my head before it was supplanted by an appreciation of the incredible sight. They headed straight for the coffin, perfectly lined up along it, heads bowed, slowly reaching for each other until they held hands. After a very long moment, they silently broke away from Sergeant Schnell and made their way to the front pew. The sergeant major stepped toward them and I held my breath. He took the funeral very seriously, and although the dresses, at least what might be considered dresses, were black, they looked more like something that belonged on a catwalk or in an escort than in a church. He stopped at the end of the pew in front of the redhead and to my complete and utter shock, respectfully greeted her and in a very formal gesture invited her to take her place in the front pew. Each of the women stopped in front of him, just long enough for him to address her with words that I could hear through the suddenly silent church. I'm sorry for your loss. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Military funerals are both solemn and quiet, but Peter Schnell's funeral was almost dead silent. Everyone in the church seemed to hold their breath, afraid that any sound would break the spell. The chaplain spoke. The brigade commander gave a brief eulogy that completely lacked a single word about his family, and focused on Schnell's hope that everyone would make the most of every bit of their lives. I waited for something, anything, to explain the four women bowing their heads and holding hands in the front pew, but nothing followed. All too soon, Fraction came on the speakers, and then I was helping fold the flag, stepping back to see the sergeant major handed over to the brigade commander. Schnell's mother half stood up, but sat back down slowly in shock as she watched him walk over to the redhead and hand the flag to her. The four women didn't move at all, sitting as quiet and still as possible throughout the ceremony, but I could see the tears streaming shamelessly and steadily down their faces. At the end of the funeral, the four women stood up as one and walked out, the blonde in front while the redhead was led behind her with her head down, clutching the flag flanked by two other women. There was one tiny moment as they passed his ex-wife, and I thought I saw something. For just a second, I was sure I saw something when the redhead's eyes darted to his ex-wife. It was hatred, unbridled, venomous, and absolute hatred. Then it all disappeared as she focused ahead and they walked out the church doors to the waiting limo. I saw his mother and ex-wife staring after them with their mouths hanging open. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. As they walked out, I stopped to watch Janice run into the sergeant major in the parking lot. Who was that? He raised one eyebrow languidly. That's really none of your business. Blushing, she stared at him. Wasn't the flag supposed to be given to his mother? Not in this case. The flag goes to his family. But she's his family. Not according to him. What about his benefits? It came to my attention that this was exactly what she was really looking for. Soldiers have pretty solid life insurance, for obvious reasons, and most of it is paid out by law meaning it goes to the spouse or children. If a soldier has neither, it usually goes to his mother. The sergeant major sighed tiredly and glanced at his watch. 33 minutes. I was wondering how long it would take you to give away the real reason you're here. She stared at him, trying to say something, but he cut her off. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that either. It's not your problem, and not his mother's. He raised his voice so he couldn't be heard in the rest of the parking lot. Have a nice army fucking day. He slid into his car and started it, pulling away and not even glancing in her direction. And that, it seemed, was all. Of course, it wasn't everything. I had heard that Janice had shown up repeatedly with her lawyer in tow, and after several encounters and a lot of yelling and screaming, had finally walked away defeated. Beyond that, however, I heard nothing. Brigade headquarters was always a center for spreading rumors. But if anyone knew anything, they kept it to themselves. 
I lost sight of it all when I was promoted to staff sergeant and then transferred to another base, though every now and then memories of the funeral would pop into my mind, leaving me lost and puzzled. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. It was over a year before I received an invitation to Sergeant Major's retirement ceremony. The base he was stationed at was only a day's drive away, so I decided to go there. As soon as the official ceremony was over, everyone headed to the reception, which was actually a big barbecue picnic. I wandered around for a bit before he beckoned me over. Have a seat, First Sergeant. Sergeant Major, thought you'd heard of it. I recommended you for the job myself. You've earned it. Thank you, Chuckles. I sat down with my beer, and we talked about how my company was raising new soldiers. Afterward, though we fell silent, I looked at him, and for a moment I saw him watching me. He raised his beer. Well, go ahead. Ask. I started to deny it, but decided there was no point. So what the hell is this all about? A grim grimace slowly crept across his face. Schnell was finished, and he knew it. Shortly after you guys got back from your mission, he went to a doctor for headaches, but this one examined him well and found a tumor. There was nothing anyone could do but help with pain meds. He was given the strongest of them for a little over a year and a half. We moved him to brigade headquarters so he could concentrate on just keeping his head down and getting things in order. Figured when things got really bad, we could transfer him to the hospital. That sucks, I shook my head. He's just always been so damn lucky. He nodded slowly. The psychologists tried to talk to him, but you know how that goes. I sighed. They did for pro forma's sake. Yeah, and finally one of the psychologists said he needed someone to talk to, anyone. He couldn't think of anyone he thought he really cared about. Certainly not his ex or his mother for crying out loud. A slight smile appeared on his face. Then he remembered someone who actually listened to him. Do you remember Michaels and Diaz taking him to Atlanta? Yeah, but it didn't look like he had much fun there. No, maybe not in the way everyone expected. But one of the girls sat down and let him tell her all about how his wife cheated on him and left him, to tell all about how his life had turned to shit. I looked at him as I had a suspicion. Really? Really, a redhead named Amber. So he went back to the club, found her, and sat with her again. It was all just pouring out of him, all of it. The cancer, the loneliness, everything. He told her he wished he had the courage to just end it, just end it all. He leaned back, taking a sip of beer. I don't know which one of them came up with the idea. It doesn't really matter, but they made a deal. He marries her, makes her the beneficiary of his military and civilian insurance policies, and she makes whatever he has left a decent life. That made me chuckle. It looked like she could do it. And she damn well did. In total, he had a little over a million in insurance benefits. A lot could be accomplished by putting a million dollars on the line. She invited three of her friends to join her, the other three girls who'd been at the funeral, Tasha, Lynn, and Sienna. Professionals? Yes, dancers and high-class escorts, just like Amber. He pulled out his phone and put it on the table. But they really did it. He was never, ever alone. He had one or more of them with him all the time. Usually three. Amber had asked Sienna, the blonde, to make a schedule just to be absolutely sure. The sergeant major shook his head. If it weren't for all this crap, she'd be a damn good HQ operations officer. He tapped the screen of his phone for a second and shifted it so I could see while he flipped through the photos. A wedding photo of Peter Schnell in a tuxedo with his new wife in a wedding dress that must have been purchased at Frederick's of Hollywood. Apparently, that's where these three bridesmaids' dresses came from as well. The smiles looked quite real. I was sure they were. There were pictures of him and his new wife in Cancun on their honeymoon. Only they weren't alone. They had three bridesmaids with them. The women were dressed in swimsuits that seemed to be made of wishful thinking and some kind of twine. But there wasn't much of either. They'd spent this past year doing whatever they could think of. He flipped through the pictures. They were in restaurants, at baseball games, at the beach, hiking and camping. In most of the pictures, the women were dressed just enough to keep them from being arrested. In the camping photos, they were barely long enough to wear flannel shirts and boots, 
and I hoped they had plenty of repellent stocked up. Looks like he didn't waste his money. Looks like it. I think Tasha, Lynn, and Sienna got more than they bargained for. I don't know how they felt about it in the beginning, but by the end, when he was already in the hospital, they were all there. They held his hands, read to him, sang to him, and talked to him until the very end. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, one of them was always there for him. When he left, they were all there, all the time. Damn sure it wasn't about the money by then. He'd never have known if they'd left. He studied the table for a minute. I'd been there. They really loved him. I looked more closely at the photos and managed to ignore the remarkable amount of exposed skin. Here was Lynn touching his arm and leaning her head against him, sitting by the fire. Tasha pressed her forehead against his while playing ball, both clearly laughing almost to the point of tears. Sienna had her arms around him while they swam in the water, both half asleep and dreamy, and always nearby was Amber, watching him with concern and care, weaving her laughter into his, holding his hand at every opportunity. There was never the slightest hint of jealousy anywhere. Schnell sent me two albums of photos, probably 200 pictures, maybe more. One of the albums is at my headquarters. I don't know what the hell to do with it. What happened to the other one? He told me to do whatever I wanted with it. I gave it to his ex-wife. After I gave it to her, she finally stopped arguing about insurance. A lot of the photos are more, uh, candid than the ones on my phone. Pretty clear that they did everything they could to make him forget she existed. Not the quickest death. Yeah, it is, isn't it? He looked up at the night sky. Though I don't think it was ever about the money. Not for Amber, anyway. Really? When Schnell told me about the deal, I got worried. I thought there was a vulture looming, and I wasn't about to let that happen, so I looked into things a little bit. Found something a little odd, and just decided to let things run their course. I was right. I only found out a few weeks ago. She must have been about three months old at the funeral. He brought up a picture on his phone. It showed Amber, much less formal in jeans and a t-shirt, smiling and holding a baby in her arms along with a picture of Schnell in dress uniform. The resemblance between the baby and Schnell was unmistakable. I blinked. What the hell? Schnell never really figured things out or connected the dots. He was too distracted to really pay attention to anything but the fact that at first, she did seem to be the only one who cared. Then he was distracted. I think I can understand that. Diaz admitted that Amber paid him to get Schnell into her club in Atlanta that very first time. I never said anything, and I'm pretty sure Schnell never realized anything. She didn't want him to know. Knew what? He pointed to the shelf behind her at a photograph where there was another black-framed photo with another soldier. She had a twin brother. Her last name was Campbell. 